He's the one credited with developing a much more efficient method of printing with movable type. Prior to the invention of such printing methods, though, all documents were reproduced by hand, one document at a time. And that's where the rub really starts. <clears throat> the fact that transmission itself, the copying of documents, is a human activity. And, you know, because we make mistakes as human beings, undoubtedly they made mistakes when they were copying the Bible, so how can we trust anything we read there as being reliable? Materials. The ancients did not have modern paper, so they used what material was at hand for printing. This included clay tablets, stone, bone, wood, leather, various metals, potsherds, known as ostraca, papyrus and parchment, also known as vellum, the New Testament was transmitted mostly on papyrus or parchment. On the picture there at the bottom, there's a papyrus. They're big. It's not like cattails like we have growing around here. Uh, papyrus grew in shallow water, especially in the Nile Delta. It would get 12 to 15 feet tall. The stems were triangular, about as thick as a man's wrist. The stems were cut into foot-long sections, split open lengthwise, and the pith harvested. This pith was then cut into thin strips, soaked in water, pounded thin, and layered in alternating directions on a flat surface. Once pressed and dried, it was as durable as the best quality modern paper. Uh, now, I mean, in terms of how durable, this papyrus stuff, we've got papyrus, you know, a thousand years old. It's, it's extremely fragile, but nonetheless, it, it, it lasts that long. Um, I've got books in my library that are 150 years old, and you open them up and the paper's falling apart. So papyrus, papyrus is extremely good comparison to modern paper in terms of holding its, its age. So these sheets of papyrus were usually glued edge to edge to make scrolls. These were called volumes from the Latin vol volumen, something rolled up. So now you know a volume originally means something rolled up. Uh, a typical length for these scrolls was less than 35 feet. Usually if they got any more than like 35 feet, they got so big and cumbersome that it just plain wasn't practical anymore. Um, so yeah, bigs like you know, 40 pounds worth of paper was a, a volume. Some have thought that Luke and Acts, which were both written by Luke, are separate books because as one scroll, it would have been too long, so they form separate scrolls about 30 feet in length. It's possible, again, not known for sure. Uh, but nonetheless, it limited volume length because of these scrolls. It's also extremely impractical. If you want to do research, I mean... You know, you, you want to compare verses side by side, but one verse is in chapter 1 and the other verse is in chapter 20. And in order to get between verses, you've got to roll this thing all the way out and look at it and roll it all the way back. What a pain that would have been. So that's, that's papyrus. Papyrus is the, uh, probably the most prevalent of early writing materials. <clears throat> Uh, there's no reason to doubt that if the apostles and Paul used papyrus as their main writing material, that those letters they wrote would have survived hundreds of years. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like we write a letter and it ink fades in a matter of 20 years and butter gets thrown out right away. Um, these were preserved. And when copies were made from them, you know, there's, no reason, there's no reason to doubt these originals weren't around for hundreds of years. So the copies could be compared to the original. Parchment. This is the other main, uh, main substance used when copying scripture early on. Parchment is the product of leather. It's usually made from skins of cattle, sheep, goats, or antelope. The best quality parchments made from young animals and is known as vellum. In, in fact, there's even a, an extremely expensive kind of vellum 
I think called something like natal vellum, where it's, it's made from the hides of unborn calves. They take it to that extreme. Kind of gross, but I mean, they do. So um, let's see, the hair is removed by scraping or soaking in a solution. Then the skin is washed, smoothed with pumice and chalk, stretched and dried. Uh, parchment was dyed, sometimes with different color inks uh, used for writing. Occasionally parchments were reused with the older writings scrubbed off. These reused parchments are known as palimpsests. Parchment was widely used until the Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in fact, Pergamum, I guess parchment in part comes from the word Pergamum, which was a center for the development and, and uh, production of parchment. But the, the, the whole process would have been a very stinky one. You know, big vats of solution with animal hides in, with people stirring them with big sticks. And uh, yeah, it, it would have been a nasty pro process, but it produced uh, a substance that lasted thousands of years. Uh, some parchments, I understand, were even dyed purple, dark purple, and then you would write on them with silver or gold ink, so I mean, quite beautiful. So, all right, books. Because scrolls were inconvenient to use, books made up of separate sheets folded in the center and sewn together began to replace scrolls. This happened early in the second century. It's even been suggested that the use of this book form was developed by Christians because it permitted easier study of the scripture, comparing different sections of a writing side by side. Uh, writing on both sides of the page, also a big plus, which was rare with scrolls. It did happen occasionally, but not, not often. Um, that's the end in allowing for all four Gospels to be bound into a single volume. Christians may have consciously chosen the book form to differentiate Christian scriptures from Jewish scrolls. That's been suggested by some scholars. So books, just period, any book. Thank Christians that there are books today. Christians are the ones that popularized the whole form of a book, something you probably won't hear in most textbooks. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the transmission of documents then in the early church for the first centuries wouldn't have had to have been by these big scrolls. Uh, where were they stored? in extremely secure locations. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a lot of the scrolls, in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls is an example of how they were stored, were stored in clay pots to protect them from the elements. And um, you know, sometimes those pots then were buried in dry places. Uh, so yeah, we know that the, the Ten Commandments, which were written on stone, uh, that was stored, of course, in the Ark of the Covenant. So you always, had, you always had some place very secure for these. You wouldn't want critters to be chewing on it, you know, or bugs to get into it. So it would be a dry place. And, and probably clay jars were one of the safer places. Or they had, you know, little cubbies, tabernacle thingies they would put it in. The scrolls of juice still do that. All right. Um, scribes, also known as calligraphers. Uh, in 331 AD, Constantine wanted copies of scriptures for new churches being built in Constantinople. He wrote to the church, to the Pope at the time, requesting without delay the production of 50 copies of the sacred scriptures to be written on fine parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional scribes thoroughly accomplished in their art. Yeah, these, these guys who were doing these writings, these scribes, they were artists. This, this was an art, and, if, and I think we've got pictures of some of their writing on the next page. Um, they, were, they were good at what they did. They were professional writers. Uh, and 50 copies of scripture, 
it's, it's been estimated, we'll show you a little later, that the cost per copy of, of early scriptures was somewhere in the, the neighborhood of 30,000 denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. That's 30,000 days, basically, worth of work going into a single volume. And he's requesting 50 copies. You know, that's, a, that's an unbelievably huge thing he's requesting. Uh, supposedly, they, they got on it immediately upon this request, and they produced them. The scribes used a formal writing style where letters were carefully drawn in block letters known as unseals. Uh, those written between the 3rd to 6th centuries are said to be the most beautifully drawn. And then if you look on the next page, there is an example of one. And supposedly, this, this is what they did on a page where we have a page and we write all the way across it from edge to edge. Uh, they would write in columns. So you have one page there with three columns on it. That was typical. This is from a 4th century copy of scripture known as Codex Vaticanus. This is one of the oldest, one of the two oldest surviving copies we have of scripture. So going back into the 300s, which is well within the time frame when the originals, when there's no reason to doubt the originals weren't still intact. So this is an uncial, you'll see in the right-hand side, these kind of capital-looking letters. And this is a Greek text. You know, you'll notice some things about it we'll point out in a little bit here, like there's no spaces between the words. Um, punctuation is kind of wanting. Uh, but this is, this is how it looks. So you see why this was artists that produced this. Um, my son Gabriel would not have been a scribe because he writes worse than chicken scratchings. Is he here someplace? Uh, yeah. These, these guys were good at what they did. Uh, beginning in the 9th century, a reform in handwriting was begun and a new script of smaller letters was used. These are known as minuscules, and there's an there's a example of that. So you see it's, it's notably different. Um, this, this also provides a way of dating ancient documents because at different points in time, different, different styles predominated, and in different parts of the world, different styles dominated. So just by looking at the text, you can get a rough idea of when it was written. If it's in minuscules, you know it's after the 9th century, unseals before the 9th century. Um, and then even within these unseals, there are differences in the way some letters were written. Uh, there have been tiny fragments of the Gospel of Matthew discovered that, that some scholars have argued just by the shape of the letters date into the, the mid to late first century, you know, like the 60s or 70 AD, right around just within a decade of when they were written. So we actually have fragments dating back to the time when the apostles were still alive. So this is, this is a whole discipline in and of itself, is just studying the shape of the letters um, and, and comparing this to when and where and even sometimes by whom it was written. Some of these scholars would autograph their work, make little notes in the side or whatever. All right. So minuscule copies of Scripture outnumber uncial copies by 10 to 1. Part of the reason, of course, is the age. You know, older things don't survive as long. Here's a very painful fact. In times of economic depression, when the cost of vellum increased, the parchment of an older manuscript would be used over again. The original writing was scraped and washed off, the surface re-smoothed, and the new literary material written on the salvaged material. Such a book was called a plimtsest, which means re-scraped. One of the half dozen or so important parchment manuscripts of the New Testament is such a plimtsest. Its uh, name, the, the main one, is codexed. Uh, Ephrami Rescriptus, written in the 5th century. It was erased in the 12th century. 
and many of the sheets rewritten with the text of a Greek translation of 38 treaties or sermons by St. Ephraim of Syria, church father of the 4th century. I mean, can you imagine having a 5th century copy of scripture and erasing it so you can write some guy's sermon over the top of it? It, just, it hurts to even think about doing something like that. But they did. I mean, this, this was a 700-year-old document, and the guy decides to erase it, not mentioning the fact it's, it's God's word. What would move somebody to do that? By the application of certain chemical uh, treatments, uh, oh, that's why, Re or reagents, rather, and with the use of the ultraviolet ray lamp, scholars have been able to read much of the almost obliterated underwriting, although the task of deciphering it is most trying to the eyes. Of the 250 uncial manuscripts of the New Testament known, 52 are palimpsests. 52 copies of the scriptures, the most ancient copies, were erased and somebody wrote stuff over the top of them. But we've been able to recover the writing underneath the stuff they wrote over the top of. You know, what that should tell you, again, is the amount of detail that goes into researching the reliability of Scripture. This, this isn't a, a haphazard thing done by hacks. They're looking at this stuff with x-ray machines. You know, the, 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 the scientific detail, the discipline involved in establishing the words of the ancient scriptures uh, is immense. Uh, letters and words were written without spaces, scriptio continua. Punctuation was used sporadically until the 8th century. Yeah, and consider how lack of spacing and punctuation can lead to confusion. What does the following mean? God is nowhere, or God is now here. If you don't have spacing, it can mean very different things. So there, there was an issue with that. The difficulty in reading scriptio continua was overcome by the common practice of reading out loud even when left alone. So they would, they would put the spaces in the words as they read. It was a, a living document not something meant to be, you know, hid away and studied in private. Uh, early scripture writing was meant to be heard. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Part of that hearing even has to do with the way that the, the language was used. You had to hear it in order for it to make sense, because reading one big word from the beginning of a page to the bottom doesn't make any sense if you're not hearing it. All right, any, any comments before we move on? All right. A common method of scribal transmission was the scriptorium. A lector or reader, and this, this by the way, is more, probably more medieval. Um, maybe, maybe more like 6th century on. I suppose it could have been earlier. A lector or reader would slowly read the biblical text aloud. Multiple scribes would then write words down as he spoke. So when that, that other reference to Constantine in the 330s asking for 50 copies of Scripture, in order to mass produce 50 copies, this is probably the method they would have to use. One guy read, 50 guys write in order to get that done. So multiple scribes would then write down his words as he spoke. To ensure accuracy of the writing, the scribes would be uh, the, excuse me, the scribe's work would be submitted to a corrector who was specially trained to rectify mistakes in copying. Weakness of this method include problems or words, include the problem of words, I think it should be, that sound alike but have different meaning, like great and great or there and there, or a momentary break in concentration that caused a missed word or a wrong word. You know, you sneeze, cough, break your pen. Drop your pen. Um, <clears throat> so the charge that the scriptures were, are unreliable because who knows if there were mistakes made. <clears throat> the tiny kernel of truth in that is there were mistakes made. 
that the very method of copying these things, because we're human beings doing the copying, there, there's not just the possibility, but it did happen, that sometimes the scribes would write a wrong word. Uh, or miss a word or two because they got distracted. Or something would happen. Uh, but one of the beauties of how Christians catalog the scriptures is that all of these various copies are actually cataloged. Everything surviving that we have our hands on has been examined and compared with kind of the original that we have, you know, the, 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 uh, the accepted version. And, and the amount of differences there are in these texts is tiny. And it usually involves something as simple as a different word or a missed phrase or a different phrase. It never, ever involves differences in doctrine. So even though these are human beings doing the work and human beings are prone to error, the teaching of Scripture and, and the words are still extremely reliable. Because there were checks and there were rechecks on this as well. Um, going on there. Scribes were paid by the line for their work. The price in A.D. 301 set by Emperor Diocletian was 25 denarii for 100 lines of the best quality. Um, it's thought that produced the entire Bible would have cost around 30,000 denarii. A denarius was usually thought of as a day's wage for a skilled worker, so 100 lines of text was probably two to three weeks of work. Again, this was a disciplined task, not something that just some guy with a pen sat down to do. And because it was paid, you expected quality of work. A stitchometric reckoning was another layer of security to ensure the text was accurate. The lines of the text were counted to ensure it was the proper number. Surviving stitchioi numbers in several manuscripts have Matthew at 2,560 lines, Mark at 1616, Luke 2750, and John at 2024 lines of text. They would actually count the lines to make sure that it was right. And if you missed the line, it was the whole thing was shot, you know, right up until the point where you missed that line. So there were checks, there were rechecks. This was a discipline, not a haphazard thing. Um, they, even, they even did things like when they got these, these parchment sheets especially, they had to draw lines on them to make sure their text was square. You see in that codex we had the picture of the lines and the, the columns are all very neatly laid out. That was part of the discipline, to lay out these lines and square everything up before you started writing. And sometimes they did this by poking little pinholes in the parchment. Uh, you, can, you can tell there were different methods of scoring a paper to use it. And you can actually tell the area it was written or the school it was written from based on the way the page was marked to prepare for writing. So again, that, that's another part of the discipline. You have to know how many lines you need, the space you need. You have to you have to carefully lay out these pages before you start working. Because remember, these are extremely expensive pages. Vellum wasn't cheap in an age where they didn't have much money. So you didn't want to make a mistake and redo it. Yeah. Oh boy, that, that I would have to look and see what kind of ancient ink they used. I don't know that it's different from ours, but Daniel, do you have any idea about ancient inks? I know the different colors varied in cost, like purple was extremely expensive. Who was it? The um, one of the ladies in Acts was a um, courier. Right, Lydia, Lydia, seller of purple. You might know this. Charcoals, 
that was big in inks mixed with things? Mixed with egg yolk and such? Okay. Well, I guess lots of different things. You could squeeze an octopus, I suppose, but that, you know, probably a little more difficult to get ink that way. <laughs> Professional octopus squeezers. Um, yeah, so inks. The egg thing was they used this in, uh, in a lot of art, mixing the, the various pigments they had with egg yolks and things. A lot of the old ancient paintings were done this way, too, and frescoes and such. Um, but yeah, uh, various pigments, even, um, even um, minerals, certain minerals were ground with a mortar and pestle to make as fine a powder as you could and then mixed with a liquid to turn it into an ink. Yeah, all of this stuff was extremely labor intensive just to get the materials to begin the process. So again, you didn't want to mess this up once you started the process. There was a lot of money on the line for this. Uh, all the more motivation not to make mistakes. All right, any other questions? All right, um, next. Scribes do not seem to have sat at a table or desk while writing, a practice which didn't start until the early Middle Ages. Instead, they sat on a stool, a bench, or ground, bowed at the back, and even writing on their knees. Scribes complained often of sore bodies after hours of copying. Another typo. Yeah, the, it was physically demanding being a scribe. I mean, can you imagine being curled up in a ball, not even using a table, writing as carefully as you can, focusing, not making any mistakes, for, for a, a six or an eight hour day. Uh, there, there, are, there are actually notes from scribes about how, you know, even though we use three fingers, my whole body is in pain at the end of a day of doing this. Uh, and they complained regularly of, of back problems and, and, and uh, hand problems. So this was a physically demanding thing. You know, anytime you're, Anytime you just have to kind of shut down your body and focus on something so intensely for hours and hours, the whole body hurts when you're done. Uh, I remember even playing chess in high school. I had a couple of games in high school that lasted five hours. And when you're done with that, you, you just ache. Your whole body hurts. And all you've been doing is sitting, looking at a board for five hours. All right, uh, penalties were prescribed, another typo. Man, I had a bad day with typing. Penalties were prescribed for monks who broke scribal rules. 130 penances were demanded if his parchment leaves were unclean or not neat. 50 penances if he took the ruled and folded parchment sheet of another monk. <laughs> See these guys stealing each other's pages? Um, 50 if he made more glue than he could use at one time. 30 penances if he broke his pen in a fit of temper. Now, I, I like how that's actually, you know, virtually not a punishment at all, which suggests it happened quite often. You know, you've got this expensive sheet of parchment. It's taken you an hour to prepare it or more. It's cost a fortune. You're, you've spent couple of days writing on it and you get to the end and there's a mistake and you can't erase it. You can just imagine these guys just stabbing it with their pen or stabbing their pen next to them and shouting out something they shouldn't have and yeah so evidently this was a common problem so it's only 30 penances. <clears throat> Much worse if you left a dirty sheet I mean, that, that really seems to have been the, the sin uh, ab above the others if it was more than double the other punishments demanded. And, and it, it shows something, again, of the respect they had for this as God's word. You, you didn't leave a messy proclamation of God's word. The sheet itself had to be worthy of carrying something so, so precious. So, 
So the highest level of respect throughout the entire process. Uh, chapters. The books of the Bible were not originally divided into chapters. The first example of divisions or headings within a text comes from this Codex Vaticanus, which we looked at fourth century. Uh, there, Matthew is divided into 170 sections. Mark 62, Luke 152, John 50. Main sections were often divided into smaller sections, but this varied between manuscripts. Modern chapter numbers are based on a system devised by an English archbishop in the 13th century. The verses that we know of today were established in the mid-1500s by a French New Testament scholar. So chapters and verses have really only been around, as we see it today, for about 500 years. Uh, punctuation was gradually added beginning in the 6th and 7th centuries. That's mostly the New Testament scholarship. <clears throat> Old Testament scholarship was its own thing, but very similar in a lot of respects. Um, Masorites are Jewish biblical scribes uh, who worked to copy the Hebrew text, which is the Old Testament, between the 6th and 10th centuries. Uh, they're credited with adding the vowels to the Hebrew text. Evidently, there's different forms of Hebrew. The ancient form of Hebrew looks very different than this form of Hebrew that you have in front of you. Um, and it's thought that the Masorites used the ancient text, and when they wrote it down, they used this new script that you see. Um, but that's what it looks like. Uh, the top line, without all the little points and slashes and dots, those are consonants in Hebrew. Those slashes and dots, those are vowels. So the, originally, Hebrew came without vowels. And you just, again, pronounce these things out loud. So you didn't need vowels if you spoke it. You kind of added them automatically. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, this is a copy obviously from a web page. These two lines of Hebrew text uh, say exact same thing. Psalm 19.8, Adonai's teaching is perfect, restoring a life. The first line says it without vowels or any kind of marks. The second uses the Tiberian vowel system developed by the Masorites of Tiberias sometime in the early 900, that's A.D. Uh, the Hebrew vowels and other markings such as the Dagish are diacritical marks, that is, they are markings below, sometimes above, sometimes inside the consonants. Uh, the Masorites resisted adding to the Word of God, so they left the consonantal text as it was and marked it up. Uh, part of their discipline also involved counting. The, the Jews are big counters. They would count how many letters should be in a given, in a, in a given book of the Bible. And then when they had the whole thing done, they would go through and count and make sure all the letters were there. And if somebody missed a letter, they would know it. So, you know, again, the discipline involved in bringing the text down to us today is, is not a haphazard discipline. This was focused, expensive, time-consuming, check and recheck kind of work. We should have no doubts that what we have in this Bible today is reliable because these men devoted lifetimes to this stuff. A uh, 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 comment on the bottom here. Earlier copy of the Old Testament is known as the Septuagint. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and it was known and quoted by Jesus. Now, this, this actually has created a bit of a controversy, inasmuch as that early Greek manuscript has a few places where it does not agree with the work the Masorites did. Uh, Jesus will quote things in the New Testament from the Old Testament, from that Septuagint copy, that volume. And you can, you can tell because the words it uses are slightly different than the words of the Masorites in Hebrew. And it's led some to suggest that the Masorites maybe took some liberties at times, particularly because A, they were, they were Jewish, denying the incarnation of Jesus as the Son of God. And uh, I read something yesterday showing side by side um, Septuagint references in the old, to, the, to the Old Testament speaking of the divinity of Jesus compared with the work the Masorites did 
and it's not exactly the same. That the Septuagint is much clearer about the divinity of Jesus, as referenced in the Old Testament. And the Masoretes kind of used certain words that muddied it up, so you're not quite so sure of the divinity. So there, there may be something to that. They didn't mess up much of it, but particularly several key sections talking about the divinity of Jesus seem to be not as clear in the Masoretes version versus the Septuagint, which is the one Jesus himself used. Uh, next asterisk there, 266 uncial manuscripts, 2754 minuscule manuscripts have been cataloged as well as short portions of scripture known as ostraca on broken pieces of pottery with writing on them. A papyrus fragments and even verses written on charms. These are also early church, or there are also early church lectionaries cataloged, meaning that, uh, you know, in the, the, the church of the first few centuries wrote down what readings it would have in church. Uh, biblical scholarship also involves looking at all of those and comparing them to the main text we have to see if it's accurate. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. Uh, in all, over 5,000 ancient sources have been the text of the New Testament. There is no other document on earth, there's no other book of any kind that's held up to the kind of scholarship that's been poured into verifying the trustworthiness of, of our Bible. We kept all of the fragments, even the ones that disagree where there's a mistake. We keep them and we catalog them and we show exactly here this guy, this scribe used these words but the main text says this. So if you want to compare the two, there it is. You know, we, we put all the evidence on the table for the reliability of the Bible. In contrast, uh, Islam and its Koran, there was at one point in the history of Islam 13 different versions of the Koran. And there was one uh, Islamic imam who gathered them all together, kept the one he called the authoritative version, and had all the others burned so there wouldn't be any possibility of suggesting that there were inaccuracies in the one copy. So no way to verify, no way to see cohesiveness in the text. We just have to take it on the word of this one guy that, yeah, it's, it's the right one. Not so when it comes to the Christian scriptures. All right, so that's, that's the very basics then of where it came from and why it's reliable. It, you know, when you hear this business of people trying to criticize the Bible by saying, well, you know, it was a, it's copied by human beings by hand and people make mistakes. You know, now you've got something to back that up. They, they tried their best not to make mistakes. And when they did, we know what those mistakes are. All right, any questions or thoughts here at the end? All right, there's a copy. Any of you ever been to Mayo Clinic and seen these? The, the books around Mayo, they've, they've actually got copies in the Mayo Clinic on display of handwritten Bible. It's, it's a neat thing to see. It's like the volume unopened is, is about like this. And they've got various volumes of it scattered all throughout the Mayo Clinics. Uh, and you can go and see it. It's, it's a, a, a recent copy, like the last 100 years or something, I think. I'm not sure exactly when, I'd have to look it up. But it was commissioned by a government, basically, and, and, and made because of the expense involved. It's, it's still just as expensive and takes just as many man hours to do a hand copy today as it did then. All right, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Merciful Father, we do thank you for the word that you have delivered to us in our day and pray that you would help us be confident in it and to follow it without worry, knowing that you have guided it down to our day that we might be wise unto salvation and receive the blessings of your grace. Be with us for Jesus' sake. Amen.